In the last video, we just talked briefly about the overview problem of spacecraft entry, which is trying to eliminate all of the huge amount of energy that you have when you're a spacecraft in orbit. So to talk about how you get down um, from outer space to land on Earth's surface, we have to consider um, the motion of the spacecraft itself as it's flying. And how you study motion is using Newton's laws. So Newton's second law is the one we really care about here. So Newton's second law says F equals MA. So what this means this is the force is equal to the mass of the object times, that's a times, acceleration. Or the original formula actually explicitly says the change in momentum, which could be a change in mass or the velocity. But we, in general, just call that acceleration. So what does this actually mean? It says if you push on something, or if you apply some force to something, it will move with some acceleration, and it will be, that acceleration will be in the same direction as the net force and it will just be scaled by your mass. So if you have a larger mass you get less acceleration for the same amount of force. If you have a smaller mass and you apply the same force then you have greater acceleration. Now this makes sense. This is like thinking of you pushing a car. If you push a car which is very huge, just has a car has a big mass and you have some limited amount of force, the car will accelerate slowly. But if you push your friend who is in uh, who's on a skateboard uh, with the same force as hard as you can, much less mass, he will accelerate much more quickly. So that's a quick recap of Newton's law. So to understand how things move, we have to understand um, the forces that are on them. Because once you know the forces, then that tells you the acceleration. And that's what Newton's law gives us this, re this relationship. And then once we get the acceleration, we can use calculus to get the velocity. Velocity. And then we can go from there to get position. So that's really cool. So this is a very important uh, process to understand that once you know the forces, once you can characterize the forces on an object, given its position, velocity, and other things, you can um, you can compute the forces, which in turn provide accelerations to the system, which determines the velocity and the resulting position. So this is a very cool process, and uh, this is one of the really cool things that I uh, thought was really cool when I was taking uh, aerospace engineering, that, okay, I understand forces, and I understand acceleration, position, velocity, but I never really understood how you could map forces to predict where things are actually going to go, given if you know the initial conditions and how things behave. So, the forces that act on a spacecraft, or, um, or any aircraft, I guess, we, we can take a generic vehicle here. The four forces will be lift, lift, drag, gravity, and let me zoom down here, and thrust. So there are four forces. So if we draw what's called a free body diagram, which I'll frequently call an FBD to abbreviate it, free body diagram, what we do is we represent the, the center of mass of the vehicle, and we just draw like a little point here. And we say, OK, the vehicle is now this little particle with some amount of mass. And then we will um, draw forces that act on that particle. So for example, uh, gravity always acts to pull it downwards towards the center of the Earth. Now, if we're just considering a flat Earth, that we're, if we're not taking into account the curvature, we can always just say that it points downwards. But if we do consider the general problem of being around in three-dimensional space around a spherical planet, then this direction is not always down because down changes direction. Uh, so if the spacecraft is, if we would say, underneath of the planet, the gravity would be pulling it upwards towards the planet, given our frame of reference. From the re frame of reference of the spacecraft, it's always pulling towards the center of the Earth, whichever direction that is.
Then we can say that there is lift on the vehicle. And actually, before we get there, let's talk about velocity. So first we have to understand, um, actually, let me first label this as gravity. So this is G for gravity, the gravity force. Then once we go um, and we start flying, we can say, oh, we're flying this direction, for example. So we'll call this direction the velocity direction, which is V, velocity. Now, it turns out there is a force which goes opposite of your velocity as you're moving through a medium, like the atmosphere. Now, when I say a medium, it could be the atmosphere, it could be water, it could be really anything that exerts uh, forces that try to oppose motion. And the force that opposes the motion we call the drag force. So the drag force always acts opposite to the direction of motion. So if we are falling straight down, for example, the velocity is going downwards. And so as a result, the drag would go upwards. Now, the final force that we have to consider here is the lift force. So the lift force is always perpendicular to the velocity. So here is the lift force. So this is a very nice, simple drawing to show the four forces that try to, or the, the three forces, um, three of the forces. Now, if we also include um, if we include thrust here, we could say, oh, thrust is in this direction. Here is thrust. So you have to consider thrust when you ha only have, or when you actually have some type of thing that's providing thrust. For example, if you are on an airplane, thrust could come from a jet engine, for example, or perhaps a propeller, or some other type of propulsive device. If you are a rocket ship, for example, your thrust will come from your rocket engine on the back. And that thrust will go in a certain direction. So your thrust force, your gravity force, your drag force, and your lift force are all working. Um, and you have to kind of balance these forces out. So this velocity, I should make clear, this velocity is not a force. This is just for the frame of reference to show where drag is coming from, the direction that drag acts, which is the anti-direction or the opposite direction of velocity. And lift, just to be clear, is always parallel to velocity. Or, sorry, I misspoke. It's always perpendicular to velocity. So let's take a more extreme example. So imagine we are a skydiver. And so we will represent our body as this little blue dot as we are falling through the sky. We've jumped out of our plane and we are falling. So you might be wondering, well, where's drag at? since we are falling this direction, here's our velocity, well then our drag is acting opposite. So that's kind of a funny idea. So if here's the earth down here and we've got our friends watching us as we're skydiving, if we're falling down this way, drag is acting to slow us down going upwards. Normally we think of drag slowing us down going, you know, if we're running this way it goes the opposite direction. That makes sense. But drag it is defined based on the direction of the aerodynamic force exerted on the body that goes in the opposite direction to the velocity. So just to be clear, when we're talking about lift and drag, it's not that there's actually two forces that are being generated. What there really is happening is there is some force that maybe comes out, say, like, uh, like this out of the uh, um, from the, from the aerodynamic forces, that it's not necessarily all in the opposite direction, it's not all the way in the up. But what we, we do is we resolve these forces, so this when I draw this kind of backwards S looking symbol, that means we're not at, this force actually isn't being applied. We've resolved it into these two components, a component that is opposite of the velocity direction and a, velo and a component that is perpendicular to the velocity direction. Okay, so that is a brief overview of some of the forces. So once we understand these forces that act on the vehicle, we can understand how it moves. So we need to understand how to predict these forces. So if we talk about lift, we can provide, we actually have equations for these things. So lift is equal to one half divided by <coughs> rho infinity, which we call the density. This is the density term, rho and it's just a Greek letter, it doesn't really mean anything special, it just means density. Then V infinity squared, this is our velocity, our free stream velocity term. Then S, which is the reference area of whatever our object is. And then
CL. CL. This is called the coefficient of lift for our vehicle. Now let's talk a little, we'll talk a little bit more about these things in a little bit, but let's get through the rest of the equations first. Let's just state the other ones. Um, so that's lift. Drag has a very similar equation, it turns out, to lift. Drag is one half rho v infin or rho infinity v infinity squared s all the same so far and then we do this one change cd this is the coefficient of drag coefficient of drag instead of the coefficient of lift so that is the equation to predict the drag force that will be experienced now this gravity force frequently people write it as w cuz it's really the weight of the vehicle or the weight of the object and this is predicted by mg. So this is the mass of the vehicle. So if there's more mass, obviously the weight is, is larger. Gravity is g. g is the gravity at this, and we just usually define it based on the uh, acceleration of gravity at the surface of the Earth. That usually comes out to be about, that symbol means about, about 9.81 meters per second squared. Now this is kind of like the standard definition that you usually see in physics books and that's what we'll just use for our approximation. This number will actually change if you get further away from the center of the earth but it really doesn't change that much contrary to what a lot of people think. And then the final force is thrust. And the thrust actually, this force there's different equations for it based on what type of thrust you have. So if you are a jet engine or a propeller or a rocket engine, this um, equation changes. And we're not going to talk about this one because we're going to consider entry vehicles. Now entry vehicles don't use any thrust. They are essentially gliders that are coming back in through the atmosphere. So for this example, there is no T. So we're, we're only considering lift drag and gravity. These three forces are the things that we have to worry about for entry vehicles like spacecraft or gliders. Alright, see you next time.